we're, we're pretty excited about it. There's some fun stuff coming up in the not too distant future. So uh, yeah, that's what's up. North British uh, single grain. Uh, this is a, uh, a bit of an interesting one. You'll note that it's uh, from a, a sherry punchin or a punchin. If it's a punchin, you know it's a sherry punchin, but I'm gonna put this up on the screen. This is an insanely light sherry punchin matured whiskey. This could be third or fourth fill. Fact, the fact is we don't know, but it's got a nice nose to it. This is a very naked uh, grain whiskey, uh, 27 years of age, uh, bottled 52.5, 60 bottles came into Canada. They're all exclusive to our shop. Um, I, you know, I was pretty impressed by this. I was worried about it when we first got it. because I was like, oh man, this is super pale. You know, with grain whiskeys, especially in their 20s, you're kind of hoping that the oak is going to give something to them, that it's going to make up for um, the fact that it's not malt spirit and might be a little more, more bland and, and plain. Um, but wow. Uh, what do we think about this one? So Evan, you're chiming in ex bourbon punchin. Yeah. That's what it looks like. It it does have some nice sort of like coconut, almost leaning into tanning lotion notes, but it's got these nice round fruit notes uh, with it. Not a lot of dried fruits necessarily, but uh, it's uh, it's uh, a nice calm grain on the on the nose. I, I think what you mean by that is like an ex or American oak refill yeah. punchin. Because when they say punchin, we're pretty confident it was matured and sh like sh seasoned with sherry, but. Mm -hmm. How long ago, like in the 1940s, and then a couple of other whiskeys got ran through this barrel, maybe three. Like Gordon, Mc or what is it? Glenn Farkless puts out, quote unquote, fourth fill sherry casks that have more color and depth um, mm -hmm. sherry notes to it than this does. So yeah, there's just a lot of, for me, there's a lot of questions there as to what it is. What I love about the nose though, is there's a nice effervescent kind of fruitiness to it. It's light. It it is clearly grain whiskey. It's got that almost slightly medicinal corn syrupy note to it, but it's quite pleasant, quite approachable. It reminds me a little bit of like whiskeys like hedonism. It's got a slight hit of, hint of uh, smokiness for me as well mm. on the finish, like not necessarily leaning into peak, but uh, yeah. maybe a bit of char. Yeah, it's chalky on the palate. Mm -hmm. um, Lots of vanillins, a little bit of honey, really light fruits. It's like a, um, a budget hotel breakfast fruit buffet. Like it's the, the like the melons and the citrus fruits that have been cut up and left out for hours. Um, probably not from the most, you know, high quality of sources. They're not organic, I don't think. Um, Sean, do you want to chime in? I'm gonna be honest. I I I'm starting to worry if maybe I'm like starting to come down with something now. But like whatever was happening before those glasses, it's still here. I'm, I I I might have messed up my whiskeys to be honest. On the palate though, I can get a little bit more. I'm getting a little bit more kind of like pineapple drizzle, a little confectionery sugars, uh, almost like a mm -hmm. tropical. If you if you had a Danish pastry in a tropical place or something like that and nice and dessert like i was actually kind of like you and i was a little worried about the well not, I, I shouldn't say i was worried i was intrigued about how pale it was i had high hopes because i was hoping it would just be like this ripping grain whiskey that like really hits you at the back of the throat and just gives you that super textural experience but it's it's as elegant as you might expect something at that age just without such heavy cask it's it's more, it's like, as I call, I think I called it in a tasting note, I wrote it, very naked, older grain whiskey. Um, mm -hmm. Harmony, do you want to chime in? She's sort of shaking her head. No, she doesn't want to chime in. Doug, since, you, since you're around, do you have any thoughts on this one you want to share? I mean. I yeah. think the coconut notes are just fascinating, where, again, there, there's, there's, um, I definitely get that that American sort of style of of vanilla and coming through, but there's almost a nuttiness there that you would sometimes get from a European oak. I don't know if that's just what was previously in it, but quite lovely. Yeah, and it almost has a, like a it reminds me of those those sesame snacks uh, on the nose, where it's got like that creamy nuttiness to it, and and the the coconut is almost like they're trying to cover up that they use too much corn syrup in it. In so much corn syrup. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, the, the the sesame snaps I think is a pretty good pretty good tasting note, pretty good call there. Well, be interesting to see how this holds up and how it evolves. There's a there's a little bit of a funk to it on the nose too. I don't know where that's coming from, but it it it's not like a cheesy funk. It's more like almost like a faint rum funk that I'm getting from it. And I think with these grain whiskeys, I mean, a lot of them are distilled to a high level of purity. Many rums are made in that way as well. You know, you're creating, you know, spirits with these very, very concentrated uh, profiles. But yeah, it's fun. It's different. And I think for its price, the price for its age is pretty reasonable. I mean, we, I, I commented in, when I posted this on my Instagram the other day, we don't see as many of these 20 something grains as we used to. They used to be almost prolific and i think a lot of companies bottled them because they were a good alternative to malt whiskeys they could put something old out there at a fair price but we're just not seeing them and even compass box with their hedonism which is supposedly you know 18 to 20 something year old grains they had to withdraw it from the market because they couldn't get the supply of 20 something grains they needed to continue releasing it and certainly not at the prices that they've been charging so Interesting to see what will happen in that moving forward with whiskeys like that. But yeah, $165 for 27 year old grain, you know, 10 years ago, we would have said that's way too much. Nowadays, I mean, it kind of seems a little bit like a bargain. Uh, dry popcorn for Kevin, maybe like kettle corn, but like not sweet enough. Like you're hoping for just a bit more sweetness to it. Um, but anyway, nice starting dram. Uh, then we're on to something a little different. Uh, we didn't want to repeat anything from our last berries tasting. We did a, another berries tasting in the summer to launch uh, some new casks that we received, like our Glen Murray, Del Ewan, Inchgower, et cetera. Um, but, you know, I keep a little stash of bottles in the office. And every once in a while, you know, we think it would be kind of fun to trot one out and put it into a tasting. And that's where this next one came from, the Berries Tormor, uh, 1995. This is uh, a single cask bottle for the store. It came in 2021-2022. Uh, and there's an interesting footnote to this that ties into the last whiskey, the blended malt, that we're going to end on. Uh, this was a gorgeous cask. It was one of those ones where we were kind of as good as it was in the environment of uh, 2021, we were a little reluctant to take the full cask. So I think we only took about 150 bottles of it. But in retrospect, this was a 25 year old single cask whiskey that was gorgeous at 250, which nowadays we'd be like, wow, that that's a great price. But in 2021, things were still a little, um, there were still some good deals to be had out there. There was even distillery bottlings. 21 year old distillery bottlings that you could get um, at prices below that. It didn't last very long. It sold out pretty quickly. So I'm going to put it up on the screen here, uh, the Berries Tormor. And uh, this is another refill cask whiskey, very tropical, uh, bottle of 50%, which I would suggest, I don't have the bottle in front of me, is almost certainly not cast strength. I, I would expect that because we were sharing this with um, either berries themselves or with other another retailer they bottled the rest for it would made more sense to, to fill it at, at 50 percent um so maybe they could print the labels ahead of time but refill hog said 1995 and man this is a cheesy funky fruity delight um, yeah this is such a this was like such a sleeper and we had uh we had these groupings of, of single casts that we would get in from berries and then be, and single malts of scotland where everybody would jump after one and it was like the the orkney and the 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 secret space side i think that came in the same time and and just left off the shelves and then with the single malts of scotland there were imperials and clanlish and then there were these sleepers that everybody would figure out afterwards like this and the uh the single malts of scotland glen talkers but uh at the time to be fair too we weren't aware that uh elixir distillers would purchase tomor tormor and actually make the distillery relevant at some point um so it, it's far more interesting as a distillery now that we're all waiting to see what they do with it. Mm -hmm. um, Sean, did you want to chime in on this one? You were, you were around for this one. Um, and I think 
I, I know Kurt was especially jacked about it once we got it, but this one might have been one of those ones where I was like, what do you think? I, you know, maybe not the whole cask, and we sort of settled on buying a parcel of it instead. I, yeah, as as I've been mentioned, like I think it was also one of those distilleries that people weren't paying a ton of ton of interest in, but there was a handful of like followers. But what I what I kind of had learned to appreciate is that the 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 consistency of quality of the bottlings that we do get, they're all good, good to great kind of thing. It's there was not too many stinkers, not too many things that are, uh, yeah, that really like like fall below average, but um. This one was another one that I I didn't yeah like as you said we we figured maybe not the whole cast because I just wasn't wowed by it and to be honest I'm still not like like the biggest fan but I am enjoying it the more I taste it uh, I like that slight lacing of barrel on the nose it's not too real for saturating it's it's just kind of like a nice balance mm -hmm. yeah um, Doug did you want to share any thoughts Harmony is bowed out Sammy I don't know if you want to chime in too if you do you can. I Two quick things for me. It, for me, it, I, it like it's like a beautiful fresh goat's cheese with some like raspberry compote on top on like a cracker that I'm getting for like a flavor profile. And and mm -hmm. second of all, I'm super excited to see where Tormor is going. I know they've been working really hard over the last year or two. They've just started opening the distillery uh, privately. I think for some independent ballers and tours. And uh, I'm over at Spirit of Space Side Festival in about a month. And they're doing an open day with Tormor. So uh, super excited to get in with, with Ollie and Molly, uh, the dynamic duo to go through what they're they're looking at releasing uh, with it, which is super exciting. Cool. Yeah, I I wasn't planning to go, but I I might be over there myself in June. Um, so may, may, may as well be popping in to, to see Ollie and co. Um, it's a cool distillery. You know, it's one thing we haven't mentioned. Um, it's architecturally one of the most interesting uh, distilleries because it's got this sort of steampunk Willy Wonka vibe to it on the outside, but was apparently just shoddily constructed on the inside to the standpoint where it was almost unsafe even for the employees to go into it at one point in time after Elixir took it over, which is hilarious because Pernod would never shut it down. They've been running it or they were running it right up until it was taken over by Elixir, but was apparently borderline a death trap, which must be a very high or low bar, depending on how you choose to look at it. Because, I mean, Evan, I think, did you go through the, the B side of Tamatin with me where there's like gaping yeah. in the steel sheeting that you could fall through with like jagged rusty edges to them? Yeah, you, we should have probably been given tetanus shots before we went on that side because it was it yeah. was rusty as all get out. Mm -hmm. um, Sammy here, I, I I think I've run out of co-host credentials, but you're uh, did you want to chime in on the Tormor? Yeah, I actually love this one. A lot of chocolate fruit, and uh, actually, me and uh, how many share a bottle? We we bought oh, a bottle to share. Nice. Well, that seems like a pretty good. Uh, a pretty good uh, endeavor to split a good bottle like this. Well, um, I think this one will just continue to get fruitier as we go along. Um, we do have two bottles of this left. Um, if anyone's interested, fire me an email. If I have more than two requests, we will draw names. Uh, 250 a bottle. It is not going on 20% off because there's only two of them. But if you want one of them, let me know. We'll figure that out. Everything else in this lineup is also not going 20% off because it arrived after February 1, but that's a different matter. Um, let's go to uh, Glenn Murray. And we'll probably take a little pause midway through this to talk about Berry Brothers because it is a fascinating company. Um, but before we do that, let's uh, let's move on to the 31-year-old Glenn Murray, which is a 1991 bottling uh we didn't get very much of this just five cases uh it's exclusive no one else in canada is getting any of this uh glenn murray as i've said many times is this funny distillery because uh it seems to be a bit of a chameleon it it also seems to be very forgiving in terms of what it's matured in um i'm not a huge fan of wine casts but i've had more drinkable wine casts from Tormor than a lot of other 
or sorry, of Glen Murray than a lot of other distilleries. And even when it's straight bourbon, it, it seems like it can be many different things. And we've seen a ton of these through the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. Um, but yeah, to me, it's like, I've, I think I've described it previously as the uh, the Chardonnay of uh, of whiskeys. Because, you know, when someone says they don't like Chardonnay and they're looking for a white wine, you need more information. Because just saying you don't like Chardonnay doesn't mean very much. Like, do you not like buttery Chardonnay? Do you not like flinty Chardonnay? Like, what kind of Chardonnay do you not like? Evan, you look like you're ready to, to chime in on this one. Yeah, I, I think that the worst thing they could say is I'm a van, Vanderpump. Uh, and then that would just explain everything with the Chardonnay. But uh, the this is like tons of red fruit and cranberries for me right now, which really surprises me. Um, really reminds me of cranberry cocktail and a little bit of grapefruit in there. Um, mm -hmm. A little bit of currant and as well. Um, just a, a really nice, like subtly fruity nose, like not jumping out of the glass, but uh, really well put together. Yeah, there's a nice uh, kind of clotted cream note for me. Uh, maybe a bit of English marmalade uh, or apricot jam. Like it, it's got a nice fruit tone. It's sort of starting to go tropical, but it's not really going tropical. Um, at least not on the nose. I haven't tasted it yet. Uh, Sean, thoughts? Uh, just like last time, I'm going to skip to the palate just because I'm still not, no nose. Um, you're right that it, it starts to lean into the tropical even on the palate. I wouldn't I wouldn't call it like a full-on tropical dram, although it is getting very, very close. Uh, one, one thing I was able to get on the nose is more like uh, someone's making, well, you have the, those trays of caramel apples at amusement parks so that you can like go and get it and, nice. and uh, start munching on them. Um, yeah, and the hits of hits of melon and uh a little bit of that i harmony mentioned like lemon cream honey i think on the palate there's a bit of that too mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah um doug thoughts yeah it, it's super interesting it's it's actually really soft for considering it's 55.7 percent uh at 31 years and and glenn murray is just such a fascinating distillery i mean previous owners have used it um you know really to test um, things out, different casks, different fermentations, everything else. So you can see a really wide range, but I, I believe it's a really underrepresented malt. And, and especially through some of the independent bottlers, I know the society and Barry brothers and a whole bunch of others have put out some, some lovely Glen Murray over the years. So. Mm -hmm. Sammy, did you want to, uh, share any thoughts on this one? Yeah, I actually you know, quite enjoy a lot of like, I, on the nose, it actually got a little bit of wine smell to it. I don't know if that's true or not, but I can smell like, you know, some white wine. Yeah. Oh, maybe some Chardonnay. No, well, maybe because he mentioned it. <laughs> yeah. It's the power and of And I know the power is actually quite sweet. I actually know quite love it. Uh, uh, this one. Yeah. Actually, same as I know the last, I know a memory we got, you know, from berries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I quite enjoy that one too. Yeah, it's got a nice mouthfeel. Um, there's a nice texturality to it, minerality. It's it's sweet. There's some nice fruit tones. Again, not like a tropical fruit bomb, but there's some real, real really nice bright fruits to it. Um, I don't know anything about the Vanderpump 7, so I'm going to have to take your word on that. Um, but uh, anytime we can bring pop culture references in, that's, that's pretty awesome. Uh, someone's asking, and actually someone texted me, I'm not not sure who, uh, why 30 or 31 ish? Cause the, they don't tell us, uh, we don't have the exact fill date and the exact bottle date. Um, we know it's at least 31 or at least 30 years of age. Uh, cause it was 91 bottled. Well, or 30, yeah. 31 is my best guess as to how old it is because at the end, at, at the end of the day, uh, it's, it's actually, you know, if it's a day less than a year, the year doesn't count. So, um, but does it really matter? It's 30 ish, 31 ish years of age. And I think it's a nice, uh, <laughs> it's a nice word. And I guess we coined a new word tonight, texturality. Um, we're going to, well, it has been a couple of days. There has, there's been many new words coined. Um, and that's, that's, a, you say, te I say texturally all the time. It's just, it's just it's building on that. That's fine. It's well, it's, it's a it's specifying what you mean by texture i think so you know. uh, it's it's textury but literal 
w one more thing I like about this one too, just before we move on, is like the last batch of Glenn. So drawing on kind of what you mentioned with like you need more information, but they're you know they can kind of go either way. The last batch of Glenn Murray's or sorry, uh, Bear Brothers cast we had, the Glenn Murray was kind of the the top like to me that was the best of what we got. Like I know I know uh, uh, Evan really liked the Tober Mori and and there's a handful of others that were intriguing, but the Glenn Murray I think was like probably the best of them all quality wise. And this actually I think this builds on that as the flavors and what it is, and it just jumps with the age. And I think the quality is uh, I don't know it it just shows what you know i guess what berries can do with those kinds of casks i suppose yeah um i sean i agree like that other that that what is it it's a 15 year old i think it's a is it a, a 2008 uh, i think or 2007 cask and it's just straight x bourbon probably refill and it's just it's pretty it's just a pretty balanced lovely whiskey there's nothing flashy about it but it's sort of, to me, one of those unsung, excellent bottlings that we have kicking around that maybe because the it looks like four or five other casks we have in the shop, it just doesn't sell, but probably should get more attention than it, than it, than it is getting. Um, before we move on to the Milton Duff, let's just spend a, a quick moment or two. Um, I'll introduce you guys to, to Berries because they do have a famous address at uh, number three, St. James Street in London. Uh, this is their original storefront. Uh, you can't see it here, but there's a little sign that's hanging uh, so that people walking down the street can see it. And, and it's actually uh, a symbol of a coffee merchant because Barry started selling coffee. They were selling coffee to the Crown. Um, St. James Palace is a stone's throw away. In theory, Prince William and Kate's official residence if they wanted, although I think they live somewhere else. Uh, but it's right in the heart of London. Right around the corner from Berry Brothers is the Pall Mall, which is the, the, one of the main diplomatic streets. The Canadian Embassy is down the street. Um, there's Kensington Wine Rooms, which I believe you pay $50,000 a year for the privilege of storing your own wine there. And then you go in and they serve it to you. It, it, it's an interesting, old, very um, affluent part of London. Um, and they've been at this address since 1695. Uh, the front of the shop has survived a fire. Uh, when you go into their old retail location, it's actually on the floors on about a, a 10 degree slant because during one of these fires, the water caused the flooring to, to subside on one end of it. So even to this day, when you go in there, it's not a perfectly level floor. Uh, the front's got scars from, from a, a bomb that fell on the street during World War II. Uh, but it's a fascinating place. They have uh, they're Napoleon cellars, which are about two stories below the main level. Uh, they host dinners in there now, but these are old wine cellars. Uh, Barry's for, for centuries now has been uh, a wine broker. Um, they, they're able to act uh, in an interesting capacity where they can actually store wine in bond. They can import wine from the continent, store it on bo in bonds, so not paying taxes, and then sell it on to somewhere else in the world without it actually being considered landed in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, the, uh, these are some of their old records, some of their old way scales. There's a lot of really cool stuff. That's the inside of the shop there. They've tried to preserve it um, and retain some of that old feel. I'm sure this is probably more a 19th century appearance than a 17th century appearance, but it's a very, very old business. And uh, one of my favorite random little facts about Berry Brothers is for the five short years that Texas was not part of the United States, but was a separate country, they actually couldn't afford a residence or a home or a building on the Pall Mall. So they rented a room from Berry Brothers and Rudd. And when you go there to this day and you go around back, there's a little courtyard, there's a plaque on the wall that commemorates the fact that the short-lived Republic of Texas used um, a, an office in this building as their embassy before uh, they became part of the United States. Um, Barry's got into whiskey with uh, their Cuddy Sark blend. Um, our friend Doug was doing some research before we started. And at one point in time, they were responsible for a significant portion of blended malt um, and even blended whiskey um, 
being bottled. Uh, they moved into independent bottlings, I think in the 50s and 60s. They've, they've also represented and, and were selling the Glen Rothes brand for the longest time. But in both cases, I think Cuddy Sark, their blend was an interesting example of a company that had a brand that sourced liquid for it, but they never owned any production capacity, or at least didn't own the production for it. And even with Glen Rothes, uh, for the 30-ish years that they ran the Glen Rothes brand, they never owned the distillery. That remained uh, part of the, the, the Edrington, the Baxter Trust. They just owned the right to bottle it and sell it as a single malt. No one else was able to do that officially. So really interesting company. I've been lucky to have a, a great relationship with them for a long time, partly because back in the day, I wasn't, uh, and Kensington Wine Market wasn't important enough to be the Glen Rothes guys. There was a much larger retailer that had a monopoly on that. So I, I basically dove in with uh, the independent bottling side of Berry Brothers and Rudd and in the long run, that's been been pretty good for us because we've had some incredible bottlings, like that 40-year-old blend, one of the Bowmores we're going to try here. There, there's been a lot of gems over the years. Sean's got the blend there. Anyway, uh, Milton Duff, we should move on to the Milton Duff. Um, yeah, they've owned, uh, they got a new whiskey shop. That's right. So they, they actually did, they've got a new whiskey shop there. I believe they're even building another spirits shop somewhere else in London. Uh, lots of interesting things coming down the pipeline from Barry Brothers. They don't represent Glen Rothes anymore, um, but in this era of evol the evolving whiskey industry, um, I don't know, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw them acquire a distillery at some point in time, because I, I expect there will probably be some fire sales in the not too distant future. Um, so Milton Duff, guys, I'll pull this up on the screen, but uh, Evan, you're probably already ahead of me on the, the nosing side of things. What do we think of this Milton Duff, 1990? You're I actually just went back and uh, I went back and revisited the other, uh, the, the trio we started with and the North British for me was getting a little bit smoky there on the nose, which was really interesting. It's also more um, neat to me now than it was even when we got mm -hmm. started. The, the Milton Duff, though, the the nose, I'm having trouble picking stuff out. Like it's got these nice melon notes and honeydew, but it's it just seems like it's going to be more dense, like more lush in style based on, on what I'm getting here. Yeah. This is the only whiskey in this lineup that I haven't tasted yet. And part of the reason for that is we only got six bottles of it. Uh, that's all they had left. Uh, one of them was open for the tasting. I believe there are three left at the shop and we didn't really make a big fuss about it because again, there was only a handful of bottles available. Uh, 30, 53.2%, um, 1990 vintage. I, I'm not even sure I, I mentioned what this was uh, matured in, but we can figure that out. Just a hogshead, just a plain old hogshead. Um, yeah, the nose on this, Seems to be fairly typical of, of ex-bourbon Milton Duff of this age, but I agree that it's not quite as expressive on the nose as the Glen Murray was. Sean, I, I mean, I know your glasses might have the meat sweats, but... Uh... I think it's actually my whole apartment because it's still like, I change glasses and it's still that, like, it, 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 it happens. Um, Are you making pemmican or something in there? Or? No, Michelle was uh, making some... Uh, some uh tender pork tenderloin and it's kind of everywhere delicious yeah um the palate for hero is getting a little bit of like kind of like uh, like a bag of jube jubes with maybe a few black licorice ones stuck in there and um it's it's almost leaning a bit more of that like high c style of citric to me as well not straight up orange but more of a melange nice and even a little like like really bready like crusty bready on the on kind of on the on the finish mm -hmm. Sean, anytime you can use high C and melange in the same sentence is, I mean, you're, you're stretching the bounds of the English language. And I mean, I'm impressed. I'm it's impressed. a rags to riches <laughs> story in, in one sentence. <laughs> I still got, got to figure out how Doug is doing all this magic on his video feed. Um, before I call him, Sammy, did you uh, have any thoughts on this one you want to share? 
Yeah, I don't really pick up like, you know, much, you know, on the nose, uh, but on the palate, I can uh, taste, you know, quite a bit of the melon, like a honey, honeydew type of mel melon. Yeah. So, yeah, it's actually, you know, quite lovely, you no know, whiskey, yeah, for the, mm -hmm. from berries, yeah. Yeah. Um, Doug, any, any notes on this one you want to share? No, I, I, I think just really reiterated what a lot of other folks said, like, lovely creamy notes uh there's like a fresh sort of like fruity fresh gummy sort of note from back when you could get like the five centers go in and you, and you get those those really fresh ones and get excited back in the day uh and i know milton duff's one of your favorite distilleries and has always held a special place in in your heart andrew well mm -hmm. what's the background on that where did that even come from uh from the scotch malt whiskey society back when the society launched in canada we used to get a lot of and I mean, granted, this was it was a different time, but like we would get a lot of 20 something, 30 something society bottlings of Milton Duff that were almost all ex bourbon. And a lot of them were like insanely tropical, very waxy. And I just kind of developed, a, a, you know, a love of Milton Duff. And I remember I would go and visit the society bars in Edinburgh or in London. And I'd go up to the bar and I'd be like, what old Milton Duffs do you have? Like, that would be the first question that I asked them. Because for a while, I think the society had the best Milton Duff cast. Like, no one else had as good a Milton Duff cast as they do. Um, they've got a slightly different approach now, which I'm, you know, I think is creating good whiskey that people want, but it's not my style. And a lot of it is this finishing and sherry. And I will say the society's doing, a, like, the finishing they're doing is done very well. But... I just really love that those naked old ex bourbon refill ex bourbon um, Milton Duffs, Glen Talkers, Glen Burgies, um, all those distilleries do really well. And you know, like this Glen Murray, I think you know bourbon for me is the classic cast to mature things in because you actually get a sense of the spirit and it allows for these more delicate notes to to crop up. I like sherry when it's good, but I think a lot of times it's just, it's overdone and it it sort of in some ways dumbs down the actual profile of the spirit. But yeah. Andrew. Well, you, answer. Yeah. Just like they say about sherry, if you want more ex bourbon casts, you're going to have to drink more bourbon. No, I mean, that's 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 what the, the hipster generation and the, all those folk are for. And honestly, the beauty of bourbon is like you can only use the cask once anyways. So there's no shortage of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. But the I didn't know we only got six bottles of this. I when we first poured it, I did sneak a taste and I and I I have to say, like I found it, you know, good, mid, like nothing like too crazy, but as it after being poured, maybe there's a bit of oxygen put in there that kind of helped that out a little bit. I'm actually really impressed with it. I think it it's kind of unfortunate we're still at a place where 30 year old whiskeys are you know 500 plus but i think it's that's a really nice bottle like it's got body to it like evan said it's plush like yeah it hits the bases well and you know i i'm gonna be the first person i mean we haven't come out outright said this but like i think there's a i don't think i know there's a correction underway in the whiskey industry where Prices got pushed too high, especially for stuff in its teens. Um, there's not a lot of 30 plus year old whiskey out there, except maybe McAllen that doesn't want to admit that they've got a lot of it. But most distilleries don't have it. Most independent ballers don't have this old stock. And as much as, yeah, we'd say like, it would be nice if this was still 250 or $300 a bottle. The 25 to 40 year old stuff is not coming down in price even if the rest of the market crashes because there's just no supply out there. And yeah, I agree. It's a lovely bottling. Um, I'm not going to say it's even my favorite. I've had a lot of Milton Duffs that I really loved, like really tropical, but it's a good bottling. And, you know, there's only 30 of them or there, there's only six of them, sorry, total that came into the market. Um, I'm sure I'm missing a lot of uh, some great side chats in the chat there, but uh the whiskey, I think it's interesting, and uh, yeah, I'll be interested to see how it changes and evolves over the course of the rest of the tasting. Because, to your point, Sean, a lot of, I don't think enough of us given enough thought to 
you know, when you open a fresh bottle, does it need time before you actually pour a dram of it? And I know when I crack a fresh bottle just to do a tasting note, I'll frequently, and I, this is something I used to poo-poo when I was young and innocent in the whiskey, like don't swirl the whiskey in your glass. You're just going to release alcohol, but you need to get that oxidation that you need to get that oxidative process started, or you're not going to get a sense of what the whiskey tastes like once it's been opened. So uh, lovely. Well, yeah, Milton Duff is great. Now we're on to a blended malt and man, there's lots of, uh, should really save this so I could read through the chat after the fact, but uh, what are you going to do? Um, just make sure you guys are pointing out the highlights to me if I, if I miss anything in there. Uh, blended malt, 1979. Uh, this one's kind of cool and, and actually special to me because uh, my brother's born in 1979. So I'm always on the hunt for good bottles, even though this would probably be wasted on him. I love him, but he's a quantity over quality kind of guy when it comes to whiskey. But I bought one that I'll probably open with him at some point in time here, just because I'm going to want to drink it with him. And even if it doesn't mean anything to him, it'll mean something to me. And that's the more important part of this. Uh, this was a real surprise. I mean, the Bowmore that we were offered, I was a little nervous about the price when we first committed to it. Um, I don't think I, I, I think I, we made the, I know we made the right decision on it, but even with this 1979, uh, I think they only had 10 cases left. And I, and I think I was like, immediately I'll take them like this. There wasn't even a thought. I didn't try it. We didn't have a sample, but I just assumed this is probably similar liquid or the same liquid that was part of our 40 year old. I think we, in, in the end had two different batches of that 40 year old as well. Um, but yeah, 44 year old cast strength, uh, blended malt whiskey, you know, what's not to love about this. So I was really excited to get this in the price on it's great. Um, if this is not sold out in two months, two months from now, I'll be shocked because there just, there is no, you're not going to get this kind of value, uh, at this age again. I know we said that with our 40 year old blend back in the day, but I mean, this is the same thing. Like we don't see this stuff crop up. Um, Evan, you want to share any thoughts on this one? Yeah. Just going back to the nose. Uh, it's got this amazing, just like clash of the Titans going on between like sherry cask and tropical notes where the, the tropical notes still come through, uh, which is pretty amazing. Uh, the sherry's there. It's got these leathery notes and stuff too, but it's, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous nose. And, and super lively for something of this age. Well, and yeah, but not just lively. Let's talk the ABV, 52.6%. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a big whiskey. Um, it's retained its strength, um, you know, from a sherry butt. Now we can assume this is probably vatted at some point 10, 15 years ago, put into a sherry butt and it was just left there. I mean, a lot of the speculation on these whiskeys and where they came from is that a lot of these were pre-blended stock or stock that was destined for either blends or blended malts. Like for a while, um, I know 15 years ago, Famous Grouse was trying to roll out like 25, 30, 40 year old age statements and they abandoned it. So it's probably not unreasonable to suspect that this might've been stock that was destined for maybe the 30 year old blended malts at that point in time. Um, but the interesting thing about it is like a lot of these there, there might be a little touch of peat in there, but uh, the profile of this curiously reminds me more of a Glenrothes I had way back when it was a 1960s Glenrothes in Sherry that was mm -hmm. fairly delicate and quite tropical. Um, the Sherry was not over the top. And uh, I know it's not that, but that's kind of what it tastes like to me was this one particular 1960s bottling of Glenrothes that we had and we did a tasting with at one point in time. Sean, was that was that one of the Ronnie's reserves? No, no, no. This was a, it was a Glen Rothis in a Glen Rothis bottle, but it was this decanter that had like square edges. It was a round bottle, like a round Glen Rothis bottle with square edges to it. It was a, mm -hmm. um, we only had three or four of them. We opened, I'm pretty sure we opened one for a tasting. And this was one of those times where I think it was around the time Dave, 
left Willow Park. And all of a sudden, Glenn Rothis was available to me because they didn't have him to deal with anymore and, and or get mad. I don't know. So we got some of these cool one-off bottlings. And it was, I just remember being a 1960s Glenn Rothis. I don't remember the exact vintage. The bottle was really cool. It came in at this weird giant leather box, but it was, uh, it was very reminiscent of this. Sean, what are your thoughts on this one? I mean, it's, first of all, it's like fantastic. I, I love how, so it, it, it really bursts first and foremost with me for a lot of, uh, uh, orchard fruit, like stone fruit, sorry, like, uh, some peach nectarine, not even just peach, but like, I'm going to say off brand fuzzy peaches, uh, there's a slight hit of acidity that really adds to the juiciness of it. Uh, like honeydew melon, it, it, I, I like it. it. It's fun when it says like sherry cask and I, I don't know, personally, I don't get much in the way of sherry influence there. It actually, the tropic, it, it's not the most tropical for me, but what it does lean into reminds me of our old Glen Roth or not Glen Roth uh, the Glen Glads of the 72 we had where it was like, you oh, couldn't yeah. tell if it's sherry or bourbon. It was kind of tropical, but really elegant. And like, and then just as a base level, it has this, it, it shows an age, but a vibrancy that defies it too. It's, it's, it's really cool. I'm, I'm glad you referenced that 72 Glen, Glen Glaza, because I think it, it's a really good comparison. Uh, I know at the time people were like, it was a bit of a hard sell because it was on the heels of that 72 Glendronic we did, which was a probably... You know, um, it, well, it was just a gooey sherry bomb, tropical sherry bomb. And the Glen Glaza wasn't quite as big or quite as rich. Uh, and people who bought it wanted it to be something it wasn't rather than appreciate it for what it was. And I think you're right. This has got a very similar profile to that. Um, and it's a lovely, lovely dram. Um, Sam, Sammy, do you want to chime in? Yeah. Uh... Like for me, I still like no taste of tropical fruit. Uh, it's actually a lot more powerful you know, than sherry. I still can taste you know, a hint of a sherry you know, in the whiskey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's not overpowering. Mm -hmm. It's just nice. Thanks, Sammy. Doug, do you want to chime in? I, I mean, I, I, most of it, I think, is is probably just to repeat a lot of what, what others have said just about the beauty of this. I, I think it's it's pretty amazing. And it's just so neat that... Barry Brothers and, you know, Robertson and, and Baxter, which turned into, you know, Edrington and has continued on this long relationship where they're able to get um, stuff like this. Because if you were actually, you know, to put, you know, Glenn Rothis or McAllen or Highland Park or Glenn Turret or whatever combination of blend this is, I mean, the, the value that you get from this just feels so um, amazing. I know it's not inexpensive, but uh I, I just I'm so happy we still get access to stuff like this because it's a style that I, I just love. One, the reality is we don't know whether we'll see stuff like this again. Like when these things crop up, uh, sometimes like and I, I'll be honest with this one, I kind of felt like it was too good to be true. Um, before we'd even sampled the Pomore, I was like telling telling my my, my contact at Chart and Hobbs, the importer. Like, please lock down that blended malt for me because I don't want to miss out on it. Um, and I'm glad they did because it, it's it's awesome. You know, uh, but <laughs> there's not a lot of this left. I think we've sold about half of the, the 60 odd bottles we brought in. Um, I don't expect they're going to last very long. So don't don't think they're going to make it to maybe they'll make it to the birthday sale. But even if they do, we're not going to put them on a big discount because this is the kind of stuff that it's already a great price and it's, you know, we're not going to give it away because we know these things are kind of a treat to have. Uh, all right. The big showstopper. Um, you know, I don't remember when I've, I'm sure I've said several times uh, after we bottled the first Bowmore, uh, which was a, 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 an old malt cast Bowmore 96, you know, I was convinced we'd never get to do another Bowmore. Um, Bowmore was one of my my first distilleries that I really fell in love with. I still love Bowmore. Uh, I remember when uh, A.D. Rattray was first coming into Canada and A.D. Rattray was owned by the Morrison family of Morrison Bowmore. They were the ones who sold the company to Suntory of Japan. 
And I guess I just assumed that if anybody had good Bowmore that could sell me a cast a bottle as a single malt, it would be 80 Rattray. And at least twice we asked for samples and both times they were dreadful. Like they were just like dead wood, 15 years, no character, no, no mouthfeel, no presence, nothing going on. And uh, at one point in time, we, we got that, that old malt cast 96 um, sort of somewhat unexpectedly. I think that was around 2018 that came in and it was just, it was gorgeous. Um, great whiskey, 21 years of age, I think from going from memory here. Uh, and we asked about others with other independent ballers. No one has had Beaumore. And this just sort of came out of the blue. It, uh, it has to be a partial cask. I mean, the fact that there were so few bottles that came out of this particular cask, you know, it doesn't make sense. This is on paper, uh, a 26 year old sherry, but, um, you know, 98 total bottles. I mean, we've seen bizarrely slow out turns on bottles before, like with our Bladnock, um, but it just doesn't make sense. Even after 26, 27 years, you'd expect to get at least 400 bottles out of a sherry, but, and uh, anyway, uh, this came up, it was offered to us. I was a bit nervous about the price. I probably said, yeah, we likely won't bottle it. It's too expensive. And then, and then we tried it and then I had to figure out a way to justify it in my head to take the gamble. And once again, I'm really glad we did. So, uh, uh, we'll lead off on this. Um, Sean, do you want to, do you want to lead off on us on the Bowmore here? I, I do distinctly remember sitting down in your office, like when we had, we had like the tiniest sample and it was like, it was split all, it, I, I don't know if it was like three of us or what, but it was surprisingly ashy for what it was. Uh, like, I don't know if immediately off the bat, I could have blinded it as Bowmore by any stretch, but the palette was, it was, it, first of all, regardless of it being just like, it was old, it showed its age, it showed its, its, you know, mature pita and whatnot. It was, uh, uh, I don't know. It was just so elegant, and it and again, it was different. It was a bit unique compared to a lot of Bowmore's of this age that I've had. Uh, that I mean, yeah, it was kind of a no brainer when as soon as we said it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I haven't really, I haven't started drinking this yet, so I don't have a lot of notes yet. No, that's fine. But but I mean, I know you, I knew you were there for that. It was one of those awkward ones where, um, God bless them, but Berries doesn't always send the largest samples. Um, you know. Sometimes we're talking like one CL, 10, 10 milliliters, which is very hard for, for one person, let alone multiple, to make a decision on. But yeah, this, it, it was lovely. It had some of the notes I was hoping for, but I, it also, it didn't have some of the notes that I knew would turn others off that are sometimes seen in Bowmore. And uh yeah, I'm, I'm glad we took a, a gamble on this because once again, like we just launched it in February, half the bottles are already sold. Um, and there's a pretty good reason why. Evan, what do you think of this one? Yeah, just I want to say that for me, especially with uh, a little bit of age, but uh, soft bull more is the best bull more for me where I'm not looking for something like super rugged or ultra sherry. And that's my biggest issue with, with a lot of the official bottlings that are out there. Um, but this one is like the, the cask just doesn't take anything over it. It's just fantastic. And that you get the tropical notes, you get a, the, like a little bit of cheesiness, but you get these, this great salty note and, and a hint of smoke and tons and tons of pineapple for me, uh, which is really, really cool. And just a, a hint of that part of Parma Violet as well. Yeah. It, it's got a bit of lavender, but it's very subtle. Um, you know, the peat on this has mellowed so much. Like it, you're all, mm -hmm. you get more of it, I think, on the nose than you do on the palate. Um, soft cherry tones, but then also these like bright pineapple, like grilled barbecue pineapple tones. It, it, it is kind of, I, I thought that Bomer we had, that 96 old malt cask was was going to be the one and only and the best Bomer we'd ever bottle. And I, and I was wrong. I just, we just had to wait a little longer because this, sort of fell into our lap. Doug, do you, uh, do you want to share any thoughts on this one? I mean, many thoughts that you probably don't even want to hear. I want to, I want to paint a picture for what I feel like right now, where I, I'm in like a mountain meadow 
in like overalls having just come out of the smokehouse where I'm like smoking some meat and out in a beautiful meadow full of like violets at like the top of, of, of summer, a slight wildfire in the background with that waft of, of smoke in the air. Um, and it, it's just, it's, it's lovely. I mean, Bowmore has been so hard for me over the years. There are times where I've had such epiphanies drinking it. And then there's other times maybe with, with some of the core range where it's just underpowered and just not done the way that it really, I think it, it, sh it could shine, especially relative to its sister distillery at, at down the road at Lafroig. And so, um, this is, is, um, lovely. And, uh, uh, I, I'm 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 gonna hold back in terms of answering the Nelsons uh, comments because I don't want to paint too strong of a picture for folks about whether or not I actually own overalls, but uh, I'll leave that to everyone's imagination right now. Uh, Andrew's already on Ask Jeeves trying to get the AI to paint him paint him that oh, picture. I, I was just in my head. I have this because it's kind of like where you, this it's like this sort of dumbfounded glee, right? So you'd like I don't know maybe that like Lenny from of mice and men, like running through a Swiss meadow towards a milkmaid or something like that is sort of the picture I had in my head. Um, yeah, it, this is one of those ones where I don't really want to say too much about it. I want everyone to, to enjoy it on their own level. Uh, it's just, it's pretty, this is a very pretty Bowmore. It also to me on the nose and palate, it just, it reminds me of like, past eras of Bulmore. It doesn't remind me of the modern stuff. And I think the reason I say that is it doesn't remind me of like the 15 and the 18 uh, or even the 25 that we see now. It's it's like Bulmore the way it was in the 2000s when I started. Um, that's what really uh, uh, it reminds me of. Sammy, we didn't give you a chance to, to share some thoughts on this. Yeah, I... Uh... I'm a big fan of Bomo. Bomo is actually the reason why I fell in love with like no Scotch whiskey. So this drum, you know, is lovely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just like you know, unfortunately, you know, the price is actually quite a big difference. I remember I bought that Bomo past Bomo, it was like about two hundred dollars. Yeah, yeah, it was a steal. Um, yeah, and I think was. I think Jim McEwen was in town by pure coincidence. And we got him to, because he he would have made it at that time. We got him to sign the bottles. Now we can go in. We won't go into this because we don't need to. The Jim McHugh and Bowmore era, um, but it was kind of funny. I think half the bottles of that Bowmore cast Jim McHugh and signed just because he was in town and happy to do it, which was was quite kind. Uh, yeah, I don't want to dwell on this anymore. I think you know it speaks for itself. It's a lovely whiskey. I'm I'm really honored that Barry's actually thought to offer this to us because this is something they could have bottled and put out in their own shops. You know, they have other partners around the world and this is one of those ones where like, it's it's just a little kind of a treat and a thank you. And I'm, I'm certainly very grateful for that. Uh, blended malt, 1999, last one. And then we got a speed round to, to work our way through here. Uh, this 1999 blended malt is cool. I mentioned it before with the Tormor. We've, had a sister cast to this whiskey already, which is kind of crazy to think on. And uh, this also gives you a sense of how many uh, casks we've bottled over the years. Because I I had to go back and look through the back end of our website just to remind myself and just to confirm that, yeah, we did actually bottle a sister cast to this whiskey uh, way back when. It was... a uh, um 20 was it it was 2021 i believe and it was you know a great whiskey but it was one of those ones where uh you know i guess kind of nondescript a blended malt it wasn't like a, a brand name single malt but it was a huge hit it was a single cask and uh here i'm going to put up the the 99 cask we did first before i share this one this is from our archive so it's recent enough that we actually have a photo of it uh, with our archive. A lot of things are predate when we changed our website and our photos, but we bottled cask number two of this 53.6%, 21.6 or 21 years of age uh, way back when. And now we've got its sister cask, cask number one, 
Uh, this wasn't bottled for us, but it's shared with us. And I'm just noticing one other detail here. Uh, the pricing on this is pretty good considering it's three years older. Uh, also like 50.1%. And uh, what have we got for cast type? Um, what does it say there? Hogshead. So I'll share this one, the 99 blended malt on screen. Uh, so here we go. Where is it? That's the wrong, that's the wrong link. There we go. That's the one we're sampling here now, the new 1999, 24 year old blended malt, 50.1%. And, uh, again, I know, well, and we've talked about this. We all know what this is an Edrington blended malt of some sort. But it also, it reminds me of some of the better, and I know I'm using, I'm kind of damning Glenn Rothis with faint praise because anytime I reference it, it it's one of those ones where it, it's very, it's either great or it's terrible. Like there doesn't seem to be a middle ground for it. And I've had a lot of terrible sherried Glenn Rothis, but when it's good, it sort of reminds me of this, but without the peat. Um, Evan, why don't you start us off on this one? Because I know you've had some uh, some thoughts on this whiskey. Yeah, yeah, I love this one. This is the one that, uh, not so much on the nose, but a, a little bit on the nose, but more on the palate. It's reminded me of the the four-year-old berries that we had. Um, it's 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 kind of the, my favorite, actually, uh, which is shocking compared to, like, we just had a 1979 blend and a Bowmore. Uh, 97, but I, I really like this thing. There's just something really well-rounded about how it's put together where it's, it's a dram you can just go back to again and again and again and, and get more out of it. It's, it's crushable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's got this great, like slight smoke, but like milk chocolate and creaminess to it. Um, Almost like you're biting into one of those those bear claws at uh, in Banff at one of the the chocolate places there, where it's got this nuttiness and dried fruit note to it as well. Some pretzel notes in there even. Um, mm -hmm. It's just a killer killer dram. It's very very chocolatey. Um, I, I like it, but again, I don't think it's my style because it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit too much in your face with like the chocolate and the sweet notes. Like I want to see more more of the distillate in behind it, but on the finish, it starts to go into that nice faint ashy peat, a uh, little bit of salt, loads of caramel, chocolate. Sean, what do you think about the this this 99 blended malt? So I, I literally have zero memory of the first cask of this. Like I do remember a cask number two, but like got me, man. I not Andrew even a lick. COVID. Remember I, like it was all a blur. Every day was just Groundhog Day. Yeah. Over and over, and over again. So I like I do have to wonder. So does would Edrington have access to other peated stock aside from Highland Park, and does this showcase that kind of peat then, or maybe or well, Ardmore? Oh, Edrington. Okay, sorry, I, I'm not super no, aware no, of I'm who had thinking, what. Like, I'm just thinking, like the you know the interesting thing is like uh, Diageo and Suntory, and I think William Grant's all own a piece of Edrington even though Edrington is part, in theory, a trust that's supposed to generate money for charity. So oh, okay. the, the short answer to, to that is it's very complicated. But yes, uh, they have access to many things. It's a, it's a nice dram though. Like I think it hit, like it hits a number of different points that I really enjoy for if you want that, that, that sherry pea, just kind of like easy drinking malt with a little bit of age on it. I think like it's priced appropriately. I, I don't I don't know. I think it's a, uh, I, I I'm I'm with you that it's not what I would gravitate to drink on a day like when I really want to dive into something, but I think it's a very pleasurable drink, and I think that's super important. Super drinkable, like very chocolatey. Uh, like Evan's comment, it, it is very hot chocolatey. Like in it, it is reminiscent to me of like back in the back when you were little and you'd make hot chocolate from that carnation instant hot chocolate mix with the marshmallows, the the dehydrated marshmallows. Um, and is that the most, you know, elegant, refined, complex hot chocolate in the world? No. But it's, when you're little, it's pretty damn tasty. And for, who am I kidding? Like, when you're in your 20s, it's still pretty damn tasty. Um, now, as a, someone who has to think about the caloric intake and such, it's probably not a, a wise choice. But 
Um, still pretty tasty. Doug, you're unmuted. What, what would you like to say about this? Uh, two things. First of all, I would say for me, this actually hits a bit more like a peated Glen turret, which Edrington would have had access to back in the day, as opposed to an Ardmore or something else like that. Ruid, Ruid Moore. Yeah, Ruid Moore. Uh, Vor, uh, however you pronounce it. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, really, it's just like, it's so chocolatey for me. It's like if I took like a, like one of those Kinder bars and I dipped it in like dark chocolate and then dipped it in milk chocolate and then sprinkled some like chocolate sea salt, smoked sea salt on top. And that's very much what it's like for me. Um, interesting story. Um, I didn't know this, but you can't get Kinder Surprise in Canada anymore. Is that, did that fall victim to the single use plastic ban or is that something altogether different? Because you can still get the chocolates, but just not the toys. The toys do exist. I, I literally was guilted into buying some for my children, but maybe they're not bringing hmm. any more now. Maybe. Um, well, a young, well, one of our employees who is a young mother, she she said the other day that the you can't get the the egg, the, the toy eggs anymore with you know, anyway, we'll have to do, well, we actually don't have to dig deeper into this, but if someone fact, che fact checks it, that would be incredible. Um, yeah, Kevin, you may have bought it the other day, but how fresh was it is my question. And does it fall foul of the single use plastic ban? Um, I would suspect it probably does. Although you could make an argument that it's, it's a toy. I, I don't know. Who knows? Sammy, what do you think about this 99 blended malt? It kind of reminds me you know, of the Toblerone we got like, you know, a few months ago from Barrett's. Really? Well, it also has a lot of chocolate you know, in, in that Toblerone. Evan, know were you putting your hands Sammy. up in agreement or in disbelief? I, need I, I think uh, I think Sammy has just like done the math on why I like this one so much. Uh... Because, I mean... This one doesn't like strip the enamel off your teeth. No, no, it, it, it doesn't. Yeah. It does. yeah, but I mean, I know it's still got a lot of chocolate, you know, in it. Just kind of remind me because recently I haven't had a whiskey that actually you know, has like not that much chocolate in it. Hmm. Well, you know, you know what actually interestingly does have almost this much chocolate in it is that new Moline Range Takara. Like they both have kind of a Tootsie Roll sort of note to them. Mm -hmm. So this is maybe a bit more elegant, obviously quite a bit older. Yeah. But uh yeah, I'll just throw that out there as a as a comparative. Uh um, less demerara sugar in this one. Less demerara sugar, that is for sure. Um, that's also a, a, you know, not to go down a garden path, because that is a, an ultimate garden path, given that it's nothing to do with tonight's tasting. That's a bit of a red herring for people though. Because the demerara goes in before fermentation. There's no sugar in the whiskey. It's not like they're adding caramel or something. It's part of the spirit. Now, whether as a purist you like that or not is a whole other different story. I, I cannot wait for Davin to talk about that whiskey because his eyes like went super wide when I was explaining what went into it uh, in Victoria. Yeah, I mean, it's not like they took chocolate. Like It would be like, I mean, on the scale of interesting i think it's quite high because you know it i don't know how long it'll be before one of the big macro canadian distillers just dumps a bunch of nestle's quick in with matured whiskey and calls it whiskey because technically they can do that so you know anyone who's shitting on a craft distiller who's trying to experiment and do something a little different you know i, I don't know i i Technically, I think they have to use barrel aged Nestle Quick to do that, where it has to be aged for at least three years first. Sure, whatever. But still, the point is they can still add it. Um, all right, speed round. Uh, uh, <laughs> sorry, I I think there was a, and I can't re reference it. There's something in the chat that looks humorous, but I'll have to. I missed it past speed round we're back to the north british 27 year old grain so here's the way i'm going to do speed rounds um since um 
Sean, Evan, Sammy, and Doug are all in here. I'm going to go through in that order each with each one. Uh, so partly because that's how I see you on my screen. Sean, speed round, thoughts, North British, 27 year. The nose really ended up being like marshmallow fluff and, uh, uh, well, not even just fresh mar marshmallow, but like, uh, like fresh and dried. And just more confectionery sugar in general. And you know what? That marshmallow note on the palate is a pretty good one. Like I almost get like a s'mores note. And uh, I think Smirnoff did a s'mores flavored vodka at some point in time. Um, so if you're ever tempted to drink that, just buy a bottle of this. It's better. And it's not full of a whole bunch of chemicals. Evan? Uh, I'm going to go with uh, the North British is you're drinking a pina colada in the middle of a barn filled with old hay. Oh, okay. Very good. Sammy? We have to... Yeah, for me, it's uh, like I can actually no smell, like taste a little bit of the uh, smoke in the uh, whiskey now. Yeah. Mm. And uh, for me, it's the same, you know, got a lot of like, you know, a marshmallow in it. It's a lot of, like, you know, a creaminess you know, in the whiskey. It's quite lovely. Okay, very good. Doug? Uh, this is a compliment. Do not take it anything other than that. It reminds me of Worthy Park rum. So like brulee marshmallows on fresh plantains. Very good. I that That is, I, I don't think there's any way to take that other than as a compliment, but I also love the fact that you felt the need to preface that it was going to be, because how often does that happen in our tastings? I probably say that almost every tasting. I mean this in a positive way, but anyway, damning with the reverse of damning with faint praise, I think is where we're going there. Um, okay. Or more 1995, man, this is, this is like some kind of like German pretzel cheese dip, like a sweet mustardy cheese dip on the nose now. Sean. I, I wasn't getting the, uh, well, I couldn't get the cheese earlier. Um, I actually, to be honest with you, I don't know if I personally have ever linked cheese with Tormor, but either way, uh, now that everything's kind of settled in my house, now I get it for sure. Uh, and the palate is a little bit more like like a bag of wine gums and Swedish berries mixed together. Mm -hmm. Fil filtered though through burlap or something. There's a there's like kind mm -hmm. of a slightly musty, grainy note to it too. Evan. Yeah, I like the wine gums uh, note there, uh, and the burlap. Actually, I think they they fit well together. Okay, anything to add? You guys killed it. Okay, Sammy. Yeah, for me, it's still got a lot of like you no know, tropical fruit, you know, in it, and uh, now I can actually smell a little bit of like you know the uh, cheese, like, you know, in the in the whiskey on the nose. And uh, the cheese is actually not something like you know, very strong. Maybe just like a breeze, something like you know, very light and creamy. Yeah, I it's like Swedish berries and aged Gouda um, would probably be where to go. Doug. Yeah. Um, similar for me, it's it's powdered. The the tropical notes have lessened for me now, and now it's a bit more of a like uh, powdered sugar on like an apricot, sort of like stilted of some sort. Okay. Very good. Uh, Glenn Murray, Sean. Uh, the, the nose, I wasn't getting too, too much on. The palate, uh, well, I no, sorry. On the nose, I was getting a little bit more of a, um, not confectionery sugar, but almost like a, like a, like a, I don't know. I made the same comment last tasting, but Popeye cigarette almost thing, like you're opening up a package of it. Um, the ones the where palate, you get like a little puff, you get one little puff out of them. Or like it's just the the sticks, the candy sticks with the little red end. Yeah, but, uh, you, yeah. but the, there were certain ones where you could actually puff them, and you'd get like one little puff of. So yeah, I think the, it was actually post nineteen ninety. The gum one was the puff was gone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh. oh, thanks, Obama. Anyway, yeah, and, and then on the palate, it was. Uh, he wasn't even oh, in gosh. office. Yet. Yeah, I know. That was, I know. That was Clinton. <laughs> you gotta blame Clinton. On the on the palate, it was more. Um, it 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 started hitting at a peach, but not real peach. It was an artificial flavor peach, like a La Croix or something. Mm. Yeah, interesting. I mean, it, it does have a very. It is quite fruity and quite decadent. I think for me, both on the palate and the nose, it's like French crepes, um, powdered sugar, 
lemon juice, like fresh squeezed lemon juice in there as well too, like quite bright and fruity. It's starting to go like more tropical, like very exotic on the palate towards the finish, but it's got a lovely profile. Evan? Yeah, the, I like the icing sugar and the crepe notes. It's It's got a little bit of... Uh... It's like you were eating shreddies with condensed milk. Like it's it's got this sweetness to it and, and this this real creaminess that comes along with it as well. It's it's really, really cool. Cool. Sammy. Yeah, for me, it's uh, you know, I came out the same, like, you know, I got the uh, French crepe and uh but actually funny enough, Danica actually that's I like, you know her favorite, you know, a dessert, you know, or the way you know she eat like you know crepes. With just like the fresh lemon juice and ice and sugar. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's some people consider that breakfast. <laughs> well, she is French. Yeah, exactly. Doug? Um, three things. Uh, it's like um, sweet apple wine gums for me now. Um, really amazing considering the ABV, I think for, for the lightness and, and, and depth that it has. And um, I did not have on my bingo card that Sean was going to be the one that took us political tonight. Those are my, yeah. <laughs> he's, well, I was going to make a joke about related family members and spending too much time renovating, but that's probably not a path we need to go down tonight. <laughs> um, Milton Duff. Back to, you know, what is it? Uh, what what does Millhouse say about himself? Like reliable old Milton Duff or Millhouse? I don't know something like that. I don't know. I can't find the quote in my head somewhere. Sean Milton Duff. It's it's it it, it just knows it's like old malt. Like you get like a really vibrant malt note on it, almost like. Sometimes when we're when you're making beer, like you add the hops and it starts smelling like Fruit Loops. This is almost like that, but it's like a like like just the leftover Fruit Loops that you left a little too long in the bowl. Uh, but really, the malt is really what's uh, what's really sticking out still. Um, I I love that the idea that adults actually eat Fruit Loops. Um, I hope to someday experiment with that, but. Uh... Anyway, I know Evan does. Like Evan probably samples all of his children's cereals because why wouldn't you? Yeah, the 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 benefit of being a, a father to young kids is you end up just being like a dumpster for all of the the cereal they buy and then or want you to buy and then don't eat. So yeah, I, I'm I'm aware of how that works. Um, this one's got like still has a great coconut note for me and. The, this light fruit syrup cup note, but it's got this interesting spiciness on the finish that I'm just not used to seeing with Milton Duff. That tends to be a lot sort of like just full on and lush uh, on the fruit side of things. This reminds me a lot of those like old society Milton Duff ballings. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty tasty. Sammy. Yeah, for me, I still taste, I know quite a bit of the uh, honey melon and a little bit of like, you know, uh, like a quick oat breakfast. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, Tom's apparently got a funny story about everything coming up Milton Duff. So we'll have to hear that at some point in time. Uh, oh man, that's a good one. Yeah, everything's coming up Milton Duff. Two very quick things for me. I know you didn't call on me. I'm going to interject. No, no, I, I, I thought I did and then maybe... Oh, it's, we're, it's fine. We're, we're moving some patico tonight, uh, uh, sir. Uh, two things. First of all, the maltiness is subsided and there's a lovely underlying fruitiness. Like, I, I think these are some beautiful drams, these these last three in, in terms of some, some cheesy and, and tropical fruit uh, mm -hmm. notes that I really, really love. Um, second thing is, is I'm going to go out uh, very different from everybody else. I appreciate all the Millhouse comments. I think uh, this coming Halloween, you should dress up as Duff Man myself. You know, <laughs> that, that would actually be pretty funny. So we'll have to we'll have to put some thought into that. I'm, Evan, do we have anybody we can task with adding that to the list of things to make, including T-shirts? Oh, if, if, no, we, we really should get some sort of person to write this down. 
And 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 if anything, you should partner with a local brewery to create a custom Kensington wine market of beer to sell only on that. I I think that is actually achievable. Um, we haven't tried hard enough on that front in the past, but uh, yeah, well, there there are definitely some uh, local craft breweries that toe the line with copyright infringement that wouldn't be afraid of doing that. So, at least the one, yeah. The hard part with the local guys is everyone wants us to buy like a pallet of beer and we've never sold even a third or a quarter of a pallet of anything. <laughs> well, yeah. beer wise. Yeah. We, well, we, we like, we thought it would be funny for my 20th anniversary to do like reference the fact that I have a very narrow range of beer taste. And then we, we crunched the math and it's like, even if I drank like, eight flats of it over the space of several months which is not out of the realm of possibilities could we sell it like because beer beer's got a shelf life to it it doesn't last forever it, you want to drink it when it's fresh but with the right marketing approach to it it could be doable so you know if you if you like stouts we could totally do it and then sell it over like a year well, we have done one exclusive step before. It's not to say we couldn't do it again. Anyway, um, a good thought, something to consider. Um, Harmony's got a better, better memory for this stuff. So maybe she'll put it on the list of things to bring up at some point in the future. Uh, blended Mole, 1979, Sean. Okay, so the... Then, so you mentioned that like we, we think it might be something like Glen Rothes. I've had some of those older Glen Rothes that way later in the in, in the tasting, you go back to it. And this actually does kind of have uh, some reminiscent notes to it. So totally possible. The palate now it's like absolutely bursting with like with kiwi and uh, what I had. I had something else as I was tasting it. Uh, no, I can't remember. I don't. I can't remember now. But kiwi came out like quite first and foremost, and then there was something else tropical next to it, and that was uh, that was a, a real pleasure. It's so tropical now, but I mean, I'm glad you kind of you can sort of, even though it's probably not what what's actually happening here, that you can sort of see that that this could be like a teaspoon or a single malt that they just can't declare as a single malt because it reminds me of some of those old single malts it's not that far off even from like that ronnie's reserve 1979 flavor wise so evan yeah to go along with what you're saying i can see where you guys are going with the glenn rothis but to, to throw something else out there just for kicks it's got a little bit of a heatheriness to it that it like i was thinking that soft tropical side of, of highland park as it gets older um could be in there too if it, it is excellent Edrington stock who knows but uh yeah just I'm surprised the the sherry notes and the leather that was in there on the first round have completely blown off for me it is just full-on tropical now mm -hmm. Milton Duff man I love it I'm I mean if you could if you can like like somehow peg that down and say yeah that's probably teaspoon or like high, teaspoon Highland Park I mean that would that would probably help with sales that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I to be honest, I don't know that we need help like this. And, and I'm saying this in the kindest possible way. Like, this is the sort of thing where if people want a, like a special old bottle to tuck away for an occasion, like you're not going to see anything at this price again, ever. Um, for sure. Maybe, yeah. I, I... Maybe you will in 40 years. I should qualify that when the like supernova of stuff that's been produced the last five years. Yeah hits 44 years of age they might be winding step back again but i don't even know if i'll be alive by then so for sure i i didn't mean that necessarily like like help and sales like again they're half sold i mean i have no doubt it's going to be gone by the summertime but i mean like anyone who hasn't like properly thought about it it's 44 years old it could very well be like single malt or you know general blended malt but i mean what's the what's the cheapest thing that approaches 44 years you've seen on the market right now? It's not going to be under $1,500. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, the only thing would be Canadian club from 1978 that they've now also run out of, because I believe they've finally balled it all. Uh, Sammy thoughts. Yeah. I think like, you know, the uh, tropical fruit, you know, um, 
son I know I think it's probably Jeffrey. I got oh, maybe. Yeah. That's yeah. some people treat that like meat, right? Like I yeah, think it is. that in the I fridge. Someone, my wife yeah, doesn't yeah. eat meat. She's got jackfruit in there from time to time. It it's got like a hipster looking dude with a beer on the beard on the package. That's all I know. Um, wearing flannel. Um, Doug. We didn't call on you yet. We didn't. We, we didn't mention your name yet. Just rub the genie. I, I mean, I, I I won't go too further down what everybody else has said. I, I completely agree with that. But I I just I flash again another meadow Doug reference of of me just frolicking through a lovely meadow with a bottle of this. Just so very very content and happy. Um, I don't think there's really any other way to describe it. Like rolls or some sort of chops this time. Well, now I'm picturing Simple Jack, if you'll recall from Tropic Thunder, like I, I'm, I'm running I'm, gleefully through a field. I'm horribly insulted that you've you you've referenced me to both Lenny and Simple Jack. Um, no, but it's that it's that level of that's that level of like happiness that like you're not troubled by anything in the world, like that. It's oh. that level of unbridled enthusiasm, as Elaine once said on Seinfeld. Well, I, I appreciate your support. I appreciate all the love that I'm getting from from the Nielsen's, which are are getting to to scary levels now at this point. And I'm I'm just going to stop here. I'm gonna, just to dream of this 44 year old for some time. I'm going to have to scroll through and find uh, Milton Dugman. Oh, well. Anyway, Milton Duffman is a great. If if only we could get a cask of Milton Duff between now and Halloween. And then we could do a Milton Duffman PR campaign around it, by which I mean like a very poorly video edited Instagram post, uh, but just that. Um, Bowmore, no, yeah, Bowmore, Sean. Or I mean, at this point, you're you're just nosing and sipping an old Isla malt. I mean, I, I'm not really sure what else to really put with it. I mean, it's not. You can tell it's not certain distilleries. Again, I I still don't know if I can really if I could blind it as this. At least not on the nose. The palate maybe maybe given some yeah yeah. yeah. Uh, but to be fair, I also haven't a lot of had a lot of like you know just, I haven't had a lot of twenty four five year old Lagavulin. There's not much peated stock of Bunaven out there or anything like that. So a, and even Kalila twenty five. I mean, I how many have I had? So uh, I guess I got no experience with it. But it's uh, still a stunning bottle. Like I couldn't be happier with it. Yeah, it's, it is quite lovely. Um, Harmony, you're going to need to provide clarification. Barry, just oh yeah, Barry and Roland and uh, Richard and Co. They've they've got a fancy meal out there in Vancouver, eh? Jealous. Yeah, there was like a literal slow pass of a charcuterie tray in front of the camera. <laughs> Uh, it was a big F you to all of us. Well, I, I believe that in the, the parlance of the day, it's called flexing. Um, they were flexing. <laughs> they were me. maybe just the trying to serve other us. F word, the other F word. That's what I meant. You know what? In, in tastings past, we would talk about such things and kind folk in other provinces would send us gifts of strange cookies and meats through the mail. Um, I mean, that that would be a way of remedying the situation. I think uh, in order to get that, we need to have at least a two-toned colored hair pro program happening, and it'd be a lot more flirtatious than we that are. That a reference to Noel? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Evan, Bowmore, thoughts? We're, <laughs> we're getting stuck in the mud here. Yeah, I, I'm trying to remember what I was thinking now. Um, was it but, the first uh, time you saw Noel with a bronzed hair? Yeah. It could have been. Um, to, to go back to what Sean said, uh, the difficulty with uh, trying to pick out old Islas too is there's there's like more unknown Isla of this age uh, on the on, in the market right now than actual named Isla distillery casks of this age. Though? Well, we, we like all have think we know what it is. Like yeah. It's one of two. So, yeah. But I, I take your point. It's can't be. It can't be named. It, yeah, it, yeah. It is that which will not speak its name. Uh, exactly. 
But uh, this one has, uh, it, it's still nice and soft and tropical, but it's got this like tide versus tidal kind of thing going on right now where it, it's got the saltiness, but it also has this laundry and laundry detergent thing going on on the nose for me right now. Not uh, Hopefully it's not like the bounce dryer sheets. No, it's it's more fresh laundry, not the the dryer sheets itself, and just it just like you you open a box of the the powder tide, and are just uh, nosing it. Uh Sammy, thoughts? Yeah. Well, the lavender actually you know are coming through now. I can actually you know taste a lot more lavender you know in the skin. Yeah. Anything? Anything else? What do you? What do you? Th is this? Do you like this bone more, Sammy? I always love Bowmore. As I know, Bowmore is the reason I fell in love with Scotch whiskey. Yeah, Bowmore and Bolari. Nice. Um, and Corey Vrecken. But but that's a different that's a different story. Uh, Douglas. Bowmore. It's interesting. Uh, well, first of all, I'm going to disappoint all of you. This uh, next part doesn't involve me frolicking through a field, and hopefully. Uh, doesn't include any references to me and I am Sam or anything else like that um, with Sean Penn. But um, this is actually subsided a little bit on the lavender and floral side for me. And it's almost getting into that sweet spot of of almost Kalila, where there's such a lovely, sweet, honeyed ashiness to it. Um, now that the oxygen's really attacked it, um, I, I really quite in, enjoy it a bit. It, Yeah. It's super tasty. I mean, I don't know. I don't know what else was. I, I had to pour myself more of it because I ran out of it. That's and, what you pour. We are curious. How many hours? Like, oh, fucking flex. <laughs> mercifully, I've I've got a ball of it here. I mean, I know a couple of people on this tasting do too. So, um, yeah, it's not like I'm pouring black bomor or something to try to, you know, make it. You just mentioned more. that uh, she thinks her inventory is off by a bottle, though. <laughs> no, it's it's actually not. But anyway, um, yeah, that's a lovely Bowmore. Uh, blended malt, nineteen ninety nine. Sean, go. So on the nose for this, it it really is kind of exhibit like everyone. I think uh, if I remember clearly, this is the one everyone was talking about a lot of chocolate. Yeah, uh, now that I can smell a little bit more, this is a yeah, very much like someone's baking a brownie in front uh, and taking it out of the oven. The palate, however, is super citric, super lemony to me. It's like mm -hmm. a lemon, fresh lemon cake with a sweet lemon drizzle, but you're getting an end piece where it's a little overcooked and it's kind of crusty. It's uh, it, it's cool as it sits in the glass there. Mm -hmm. Sorry oh. to to bust in there. I'm Sean. I'm really happy you said that because everybody was going on about chocolate, 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 and I was like, "Am I insane?" Because there's so much more than chocolate to me. And that vibrancy of those citrus fruits, kind of that like zestiness was really showing for me that no one else was talking about. It. And I thought something was wrong with me. <laughs> so, it Harmony, you brought up uh, cannabis related products earlier on tonight. This reminds me of a time I was at a friend of my wife's house. He had, this is pre-legalization, uh, cannabis infused chocolate chip cookies. Um, I knew that at the time, but after I had the first one, I wasn't thinking about that. I was just hungry and I kept eating them. And this remind it, it turned into a bit of a night. Um, but it reminds me of those like marijuana infused chocolate chip cookies. I think you're describing like a munchy infinity where it's just perpetual at that point. Oh, <clears throat> it is. It's, it's almost like, uh, yeah, it's a vicious circle. It's hard to get out of that kind of vicious circle. Like, mm -hmm. There's not enough milk and chocolate chip cookies in the world to pull you out of that that tailspin. But Evan, thoughts on the blend? Yeah, milk? I am going to add a cream of mushroom soup to the mix on this one. Uh, it's it's gone a little bit mushroom and in a really homemade. cool manner. And or homemade? Uh, I'm going to say homemade. It, it like It's not just the cream that's coming out. It is the mushrooms as well um and not the the kind that you put in brownies or anything like that just actual mushrooms so not microdosing. yeah that's right and uh yeah no msg presumably because you went the homemade route uh sean no sorry sorry sammy 
two names that start with S. Uh, now, actually, now you know, uh, I can actually taste a little bit more citrus fruit in it. And uh, a little bit like, you know, more wood in the uh, in the whiskey. Yeah, it's not, you know, I'll come out. Okay, thanks, Sammy. Douglas? It's nice. The, the chocolate's really subsided now for me. And, and I agree with Sammy. It's, 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 there's a citrus note for me. It's almost like an old cognac barrel that you filled full of like beautiful, fresh orange rinds that you've kind of like rolled down the road in rural Saskatchewan just to sort of pull every ounce of remaining liquid out of it and then pouring it into the glass. Um, Again, painting uh, quite the tapestry for everybody tonight. Would would this have been like at a time of year or year when there happened to be a lot of grasshoppers as well, or like less grasshoppers? I feel like maybe even like end end after after harvest celebration of some sort, post okay. harvest. No, okay. nobody you know maimed by a combine, so there it's a double celebration. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Um. Well, Doug, would would you be wearing overalls during this harvest? Oh my god! I I I love that this is the first time that you you've interjected not to only comment on Sean Harmony. So I'll take that as a compliment. Uh, it also scares me that you've made multiple comments about me in overalls in the comments, and and now on the the thing. But again, I take it as a huge compliment. So thank you. You should. You've piqued my curiosities, friend. Mm. <laughs> um, I mean, after harvest you know, reminds me of uh, the time uh, my dad, brother, and I went out to Saskatchewan to buy, bring my grandma's car back because she was deemed not capable of driving anymore. And uh, we turned on the vents for the first time, not air conditioning, because this was a 1978 Plymouth Caravel. And 15 years of dried leaves came blowing out the air vents when we turned it on. So um, interesting things happen. Um, in the middle of nowhere between Saskatchewan and Alberta. Uh, Evan, can you fire up the poll? We'll let people start voting. And maybe I'll do this in reverse order. Um, favorites, uh, you get three. I'm gonna start, well, actually, you know what? I'm gonna start with Harmony, because even though she was not gonna play with us entirely because of her palate, she still stuck around, she's still there. So ladies uh Harmony. I only opted out on the first one because I was battling a sneeze and was afraid oh. that because I was sick, it would be disgusting and live. Um, but um, based on the results of what was left in my glass after first round, the last three were my favorite. <laughs> um, I, in private conversation, was saying that Sammy may have been sampling too much while pouring. Because my 1979, my Beaumar, and my 1999 seem short. Um, oh. That I loved the acidity and the fruitiness on the 1979. Like um, often, I find the older grains go really creamy and rich. They still maintain this nice fruit note, but it leans more into like brown fruits. Thanks, Jen. Um, but this one was like bright and robust and I really loved the blend of the 1979 um Evan I'm totally with you the more that 1999 blend stuck around the more uh awesome and weird it became <laughs> um I really enjoyed it um my favorite was the 1979 um I've always loved blends and uh, this, as I said in the chat, just like solidified my my love for blends. And then I think my second favorite is the Glen Murray. I, I thought that was just absolutely gorgeous. I loved our first Glen Murray. And uh, I just, uh, it breaks my heart when core bottlings are just not this, but it just, um, I'm so grateful for independent bottlers because that Glen Murray was, was a knockout for me. Okay. Cool. Doug, I think you're next. I think uh, reverse order. Three favorites. I, I mean, the, the 1979, um, I, I absolutely love. Um, the uh, 
the the bow more on the second pass i i really really loved and for some strange reason the tour more i'm really drawn to through a couple of its different stages the the super fruitiness the cheesiness um it's got a, a special place in in my heart but honestly all of these were really lovely so i could probably do this again tomorrow night and have different discussions and decisions uh but i think we can all agree that uh me and overalls is going to stick with everybody tonight so where did that even start the it was it was me smoking something uh smoking meat in the in a field on the bowmore and then That's it was me frolicking through a field uh with the 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 44 year old and now it's it's people i think are putting stuff through dolly and now creating dudes with flat caps with checkered shirts and overalls um that check far too many dug boxes so and but yeah. you don't have you don't have ear spacers i don't think i won't go too far down that rabbit hole can someone put a dug face on this man because i want a t-shirt yeah that, that's a hunter skill i don't know if anyone else has that skill i mean he somehow morphed my face with kim jong-un um and he well, he he just found he found a lot of free time at work that the rest of us don't. I I think is what, the way that worked. Yeah, well, that's he did get away with murder on many occasions. But to be fair, um, Sammy, your three favorites. Uh, the first one is the uh, nineteen seventy nine. It just got a lovely, like a long, like super long finish on that one. And then the second one is the uh, Bomo. Okay. And what the about? last one is the uh, Grand Murray. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Doug, I don't want you to be worried, but people are trying to get photos of you through the chat. Um, we'll, we'll see what happens on that front. Uh, Evan, you're up. Three favorites. Uh, 99 blend, Bowmore, and then I think the... I think the Glen Murray just slightly tips out the, 90, the 79 blend for me. Okay. Well, I love that you're always different. There's there's an honesty to that, Sean. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna go slightly different too. So I'm actually gonna like I'm 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 gonna take the 79 and the Bowmore out of it. Although if I were to keep it in, I would say 79 and Bowmore. But if we did a taste a berry tasting without those two, I would initiate a writing campaign for those two. So keep them out. I'm gonna say my first place other than those is the Glen Murray. The second is probably the Milton Duff, and number three is probably the 99 Blended Malt. <laughs> I love how you managed to sneak five favorites in there. Uh <laughs> incredible. Um I'm gonna I'm gonna buck the trend a bit on this. I'm going Bowmore 79 blended malt and then Milton Duff. I really like the Glen Murray too. Um I, I like the 99, but I don't think it holds a candle to the other four. Um it's just it's just not rich enough, it's just not complex enough. Uh it's good. Um, and bizarrely, I, you know, even though I didn't finish it and I mean, I love the Tormor, like I, I think even though Chris thinks this is, you know, that he's learned tonight that grains need to be at least 28 years of age, which is by the way, pretty funny. Um, I, I actually think it held its own in a range of things that are a lot more expensive and single malts. Uh, it's different. It's not, um, that, that would be my honorable mention. So Bowmore 79, Milton Duff, because Milton Duff, um, everything's coming up Milton Duff, as I said once in the chat. Um, hopefully we can get a cask between now and then, because that would be that would be kind of fun. Probably a waste though. Uh, but yeah, great range. Evan, um, there are the results. So the people have spoken. And it looks like the Bowmore edges out for first favorite. The 79 comes in second and the blended malt comes in third. And then for second favorite, the blended malt storms to the front and then a really strong showing by the Glen Murray. Um, fascinating. Uh, I think everything except the North British got at least one boat. And then there's, as always or often, Evan comes up with a third whole question which i'm only realizing now should we do an all blended scotch tasting in the future hell yes 15 and hell no three 
Um, interesting. So who, uh, oh, I think I killed that. I don't know if people were still looking at the, uh, looking at the poll, wanted to, wanted to see it. Um, great range tonight. Appreciate everyone taking part. Apologies that now everyone's got an image of Doug in overalls running through a meadow um, with smoked meat or cured meat or something. Uh, but that was a great range. Uh, we're taking a break until Wednesday. I think we've got the society tasting coming up. Um, and then there's a bunch of tastings coming up in April. I want to say thank you to uh, Sean, Evan, Harmony, Sammy, and Doug, who unwittingly <laughs> joined us to become the brunt of some jokes. Um, but it was a good sport, so appreciate that. Thank you, everybody, for taking part in the tasting. I hope you enjoyed it. I think it was a great lineup. Reminder, we do have stock of all of the whiskeys except the Tormor. There's two bottles. If you're interested in that, send me an email. Um, by the time I check my email tomorrow afternoon, if you've got a request in there and there's more than two requests, I'll draw names by ballot. Um, but other than that, hopefully we'll see you at a future tasting. Reminder that Saturday is a uh, um, is a one-day sale. That's coming up too. Um, I'm not going to just kill the feed outright, but I'm going to stop the recording and uh, uh, the Facebook feed. So bye everybody who's watching on there.